If we look at a globe or a map of the Eastern Hemisphere, we shall perceive between Asia and Australia a number of large and small islands, forming a connected group distinct from those great masses of land, and having little connection with either of them. Situated upon the equator and bathed by the tepid water of the great tropical oceans, this region enjoys a climate more uniformly hot and moist than almost any other part of the globe and teems with natural productions, which are elsewhere unknown. The richest of fruits and the most precious of spices are here indigenous. It produces the giant flowers of the Rafflesia, the great-winged Ornithoptera, princes among the butterfly tribes, the man-like Orangutan, and the gorgeous birds of paradise, found nowhere beyond the limits of this insular tract, which has hence been named the Malay Archipelago. With these words, Alfred Russell Wallace began his account of his eight years of exploration, collection, and discovery in what is now the island nation of Indonesia. His travels totaled 14,000 miles, during which his collections amounted to 125,660 specimens. The wonders Wallace found in the corners of this island chain led to his discovery of evolution by natural selection, independently from Darwin. It happened a year and a half before Darwin's Origin of Species was published. It was during a severe bout of malaria on the island of Ternate. Between bouts of dry heaving, Wallace suddenly shot up in bed, grabbed his journal, and started scribbling. He sent his idea to his hero and role model, Charles Darwin. The rest is natural history. Despite a legacy in Darwin's shadow, no one can deny the genius of this man. Darwin said of Wallace's letter that, if Wallace had my manuscript, he could not have made a better short abstract. In addition to discovering evolution, Wallace also laid the groundwork for the field of biogeography, and even presaged plate tectonics. He published and lectured right up to his death at the age of 90. He was a wild-eyed prophet, crying out from the Malaysian wilderness, rocking Victorian cages from halfway around the world, making even Darwin seem crotchety and conservative by comparison. Tonight, we will dwell on the landscape that fueled his genius, the constellation of islands that was his muse, the 17,506 islands of Indonesia, the largest archipelago in the world. Eight years he spent lost among them, surrounded by a terrifying diversity of unimaginable creatures, colors, landscapes, peoples, and diseases, a potent recipe for inspiration. What was it about this place that disclosed for Wallace life's most jealously guarded secrets? Why, of all places, this island nation? It was with this burning question in mind that I devoted a year to discovering Indonesia for myself. With support from the Fulbright program, I traced Wallace's steps around the island arc, his memoirs as my guide. I witnessed for myself some of the very insects and landscapes that he did that made him tremble with excitement and question convention. Tonight I will share some experiences from that year. I will work my way up from the region's geologic foundations to the various tribes of life found in the archipelago, from Alpha to Omega, from rocks to whales. Five large main islands dominate Indonesia's map. From the west, Sumatra, where I was based, and the capital of its southern province, then Java, host of the nation's capital of Jakarta, and the most densely populated island on the planet, the legendary Borneo, whose Indonesian portion is named Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and to the east, Papua, whose Indonesian half is Irian Jaya. A few more island groups are useful to know. There's the tourist trap of Bali, but gateway to the Nusa Tenggara group. There's also Timor and the exotic Malukus. The life of Indonesia evades generalization. Summarizing its diversity is simply impossible, simply because its biosphere is bisected in two. It's a bipolar, two-faced country, one that can only invite a closer look. During his travels, Wallace noticed a curious pattern that the flora and fauna he had collected in the western island groups were nothing at all like those he had found in the east. Out west there were groups like tigers, elephants, orangutans, pangolins, hornbills, rhinos, trogons, bee-eaters, rafflesia flowers, and gibbons. But to the east there was none of that, but instead even weirder animals like birds of paradise, tree kangaroos, cassowaries, cockatoos, and flying lizards. 
What's more, it wasn't just a gradual change in composition, it was quite stark, as in, the composition of life was completely different on islands less than 15 miles apart. 15 miles! So this isn't a gradient, this is a line. Wallace's line. Wallace had noticed and described what is now the world's most famous case study in biogeography. As the region received further scrutiny over the decades by other scientists, more lines have been added to the map. We now recognize three biotic subregions in the archipelago. To the west, the Oriental subregion, and to the east, the subregion known as Australasia. In the center is a thin mixing zone, and as such it harbors the most diverse ecosystems in the archipelago. It is named Wallacea. Wallace was the first naturalist to notice this divide in the Arc's biosphere, but he struggled for the rest of his life with how to explain it. As a geologist, he understood that this line was indicative of a deeper pattern in the bedrock itself, that the Oriental and Australasian bioregions are sitting atop two very distinct chunks of the Earth, two shallow shelves separated by deep oceanic trenches. The Oriental subregion was resting on the Sunda Shelf, which included Java, Sumatra, Borneo, Southeast Asia, and the Malay Peninsula, and the Philippines as well. The Australasian subregion was resting on the Sahul Shelf, composed of the entire island of Papua, Australia, and the surrounding Pacific Islands. And Wallace understood that shallow shelves can create land bridges when sea levels fluctuate. Here you see how the Sunda Shelf looked during the last ice age, rather than 17,506 islands, just a few gigantic peninsulas. But these age-old theories do not explain everything. The problem boiled down just to how sharp that line was. The fact that forests on islands 15 miles apart were nigh unrecognizable. Sure, there had been some mixing, the subregion of Wallacea demonstrates its extent, but why not more? It's as if there was something recent about Wallace's line. Elsewise, if it had been like this since the beginning, the archipelago would have homogenized long ago. And so the naturalist remained vexed. It would be another half-century before anyone returned to the idea of continental drift, let alone outline the mechanics of tectonics and its role in the distribution of life. Had he been able to do so himself, Wallace would have been responsible for not one, but two of the most important discoveries in natural history. All thanks to Indonesia's curiosities. This only goes to enforce my basic thesis, there is something about this archipelago. Wallace would not live to see his line explained. He would never know that his collections represented a still frame in an ongoing collision of two tectobiotic zones, zones that had evolved in isolation for tens of millions of years. It has only been since a geologic yesterday that they have been such intimate neighbors, and that is why they are still so different, why the line is still so sharp. And Indonesia is the interface. Looking at its tectonic environment, one can get a sense of the chaos at work behind this archipelago. Plates are double, triple, and quadruple faulting against each other, the smaller ones swirling in the eddies of their more insistent neighbors. Indonesia, a splatter-paint masterpiece, splayed upon a tumultuous, tectonic canvas. It is no coincidence that the world's largest archipelago lies along one of the longest, most active, and most complex subduction zones in the world. Known as the Sunda Arc, it forms a central backbone of volcanic cones for thousands of miles. The Vulcan cradle of a newborn nation, it is the only reason Indonesia exists. Indonesia has more volcanoes than any other country. Her 87 active cones and myriad dormant ones account for one-sixth of all known eruptions in the world. Three of the world's five most powerful eruptions have taken place within Indonesia. The notorious Krakatoa, which I will discuss in a moment. The second most powerful, Tambora. And the most powerful eruption in the Earth's geologic record, Toba. Mount Toba, in northern Sumatra, erupted 74,000 years ago. The crater it left is now holding Southeast Asia's largest lake. Known as Yellowstone's bigger sister, this supervolcano's eruption displaced 670 cubic miles of rock. All around Southeast Asia, it deposited up to 9 meters of ashfall. The sulfur dioxide it released created acid rain fallout around the world. You can see how high the plateau of the resurgent cone is, big enough for me to get lost on my motorbike for a half day. I finally ran into two men spear hunting for pigs, and they helped me get my bike out of a swamp. So yes, subduction begets volcanoes, and volcanoes beget islands. Islands beget a huge diversity of life, as well as diverse landscapes and fertile soils, which in turn 
tend to beget diverse and populous cultures. Indonesia is the epitomic example. It is a country with over 250 million people, the fourth most populous country in the world after China, India, and the USA. It's bigger than most people realize, wider than the United States. More than 700 ethnic groups, speaking a total of 726 languages, can be found within its borders. It is both the world's most religiously diverse nation and the most populous Muslim nation. 85% practice Islam. Such a varied and earnest religious geography only makes sense given the fickle and contradictory landscapes that comprise the nation. You never know when the land underneath your feet is going to explode. I experienced several earthquakes during my time there, and even witnessed one volcanic eruption in East Java. This volcano just exploded right in front of us. There's the eruption coming off from the left side. We're looking at in the Mount Bromo, Mount Simaru area in East Java. I am freaking out. Subduction giveth and subduction taketh away. Of all nations on earth, Indonesia suffers the most death and land damage due to natural disasters. Superstition still plays an important role in East Indian attitudes towards their volcanoes. Mount Bromo in East Java is a prime example, where they ritually throw chickens and flowers into the smoldering cone. We climbed Mount Bromo, paid our tithe to Vulcan, and snuck a peek into the Bromo crater. I was incredulous and dumbfounded. Um, 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 um. I was losing it.